All right, so it is my turn now. Uh, the perspective, of course, is going to be from the point of view of a cosmologist. We've heard the astrophysicist and the particle physicist. Clearly, a cosmology encompasses both. So I'll try to give an overall view of okay, how a cosmologist look at this problem. I think it's a great idea that such a discussion is put forward. Uh, clearly, our communities sometimes lack uh, sufficient communication. So being able to bridge the gaps you know, uh, is crucial for us now. So indeed, this is what uh, cosmology can do. Of course, we do this in the context of a, a broader picture, which is that of the uh, standard model of cosmology, whose bases are general relativity, thermodynamics, quantum field theory, and in particular, uh, inflationary ideas or predictions on uh, how the universe began and how we generated the structure we observe. So this common paradigm for the formation of structure is based on a dynamics in the early universe, which uh, drove the tremendous expansion at the beginning, which generated all the matter that we uh, look around us, so baryons, you know, photons, but also uh, possibly a new ingredients. Uh, and in particular, it produces also curvature fluctuations. Now, those fluctuations they can be understood as places where you would tend to concentrate matter. Okay, uh, those concentrations of matter can be seen very clearly as temperature and isotropies in the microwave background. We see the background coming from 380,000 years after Big Bang, which is not perfectly isotropic. It has a different uh, patches, patterns in the sky, which uh, come from statistics can be derived from what you would expect from a, an early period of inflation. And I insist on this because this will be a crucial for understanding a, a new possible ingredient of dark matter. Now, of course, we would also like to see the background from gravitational waves. Uh, there has been a revolution we're all immersed in nowadays with new observations coming from these gravitational wave detectors, LIGO, Virgo, and soon Kagra. Hopefully, in the future, we'll be able also to measure the stochastic background of gravitational waves coming from, uh, from the early universe. So we have with us uh, the temperature and isotropies. We also have with us the evolution of those in homogeneities that we observe one part in 10 to the five at the CMB forming structures, forming the very logical structure. And fortunately, there is a common paradigm, inflation, which gives rise to a primordial spectrum that later on through evolution, through the dynamics of the matter content, and this is where we're going to infer from there what is actually its matter and energy content of the universe, it gives rise to structures of this cosmic wave. Here you have these two complementary pictures, the C and B and isotropies at redshift 1100, and those fluctuations that we can measure when looking at the galaxy surveys. For instance, this is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Nowadays, we have the Dark Energy Survey. So we'll have Euclid, LSST, DESI, etc. And they're mapping different scales of the universe. They're mapping the very large scales of the universe. On the right hand side here, you would find scales corresponding to galaxies. So here we're beginning to see the structures of galaxies, how they clump together in this famous body and acoustic oscillations. And in the CMB, we almost match. We have some common uh, connection between the scales corresponding to the CMB and those corresponding to a large structure. And we observe that there is a common picture mm, to both. And this common picture is what we call the standard model of cosmology. It contains a basic relation which uh, uh, makes a connection between the rate of expansion of the universe, something that we could measure locally and also in the early universe, together with what is this matter content. The radiation component, photons in the past, now they're not as abundant. Neutrinos, if they are some of these neutrinos which are relativistic, they would also contribute to the expansion of the universe. You can have the matter, which itself contains essentially two components, baryonic matter, the ones we're made of, the ones stars are made of, galaxies, as well as a dark matter, dark matter that we know what it, we don't know what it is, right? We, we're exploring precisely this uh, discussion is uh, all about. It. But there is another ingredient which will be important uh, and it will be crucial to uh, encompass in the whole picture, which is a dark energy or vacuum energy, whatever drives the accelerated expansion of the universe. We will see that this might pose a problem and we might be able to give a, a different handle on that problem. And this will affect overall the, the, uh, our understanding of the nature of dark matter. So the, these two big incognita that we have today in the standard model of cosmology, what is dark matter, what is dark energy, may come together. 
Now, it's sufficient with just a few parameters. Here, there are listed seven to describe the present expansion of the universe and uh, the matter abundance. But possibly you'd like to uh, know what uh, other components uh, could be responsible for, for some of these ingredients, in particular, the dark matter component. Now, here's where uh, there's so much uncertainty because there are almost 20, 90 orders of magnitude in mass and 60 orders of magnitude in cross section for these components to uh, contribute as cold dark matter. So dark matter that it has small velocities and may clump and form structure like the ones we observe in the uh, galaxy surveys. So we could go from all the way 10 to minus 20 electron volts on the left hand side, fastly dark matter, to extremely massive objects, like machos or uh, black holes, which could have been formed, as I will describe in a minute, in the early universe out of the uh, quantum fluctuations, just like those that we observe in the CMB, which might give rise to enough component to give, to explain the structure we observe in, in the galaxy. Moreover, try to address the issues that uh, Jorge was uh, addressing initially on the small scale structure. So perhaps there are different clues onto the phenomenology that we observe from very small scales all the way to horizon where the nature of dark matter can be addressed. So realize that we are really dealing with a big problem. Many, many orders of magnitude in different dimensions have to be explored in order to arise to a common consensus on this. So I'm sure it will take time. So there is the, the particle uh, approach, which Maria Luisa was uh, describing to us, but there is also the possibility that we might have different components. Huh? And in particular, something which we are uh, very much, uh, um, we understand in this uh, common paradigm structure formation is that very large fluctuations, the large fluctuations that we observe on, on large scales, in particular in the CMB, may have arisen from early period of inflation. Now, the dynamics of inflation is still a big uncertainty. It might happen that some dynamics, as the uh, this energy gets released and the the uh, the inflaton, whatever uh, that field is, could be the Higgs, right? it just uh, releases its energy. You it ends up before reheating the universe, having a, a very special uh, period where it makes a big uh, contribution to the uh, curvature fluctuations. And in that case then there is the possibility, the chance that uh, those fluctuations enter the universe in the radiation era and collapse to form black holes. Now, this is something that we are familiar with. We are familiar in the case of body acoustic oscillation observed in the CMB, that there is two forces opposing each other in the early universe. You have, for, on the one hand, gravity, which tends to attract. In the case of the plasma, it's compressing the plasma. But Obviously, the plasma, it's a charge. It has electrons and, and, and uh, variants and, and photons are scattering off this, producing a radiation pressure. This radiation pressure opposes gravitational collapse. If there is a, a, a more or less a compensation of a radiation pressure and collapse, you enter into an acoustic oscillation process, which gives rise to the features we observe in the CMB and in the structure. However, it might happen that this dynamics that I was saying at the end of inflation might produce curvature fluctuations, just identical to those that we observe, they're already been seen in the CMB, but of larger amplitude, which inevitably produces gradient forces, which uh, cannot prevent collapse. That means the uh, gradients induced by gravitational collapse are stronger than those of radiation pressure. In this case, the horizon, the full horizon of that the universe at the time in, in, in one particular horizon will collapse to form a black hole, not the whole space time, but only a few places. Now, those few places are enough, yeah, if this occurs early, sufficiently early on, to contribute today as dark matter. These primordial black holes, as we call them, in, which were forming the primordial plasma, these primordial black holes would still be there around while photons and baryons interact, and before recombination, they uh, would have started to form structures. In particular, they would tend to coalesce among themselves. They would form clusters. Mm -hmm. they, very early on, soon after they form, they find each other and start forming clusters while the rest of the radiation is wearing around. And this is crucial because there, it has been proposed, this is not a new idea, primordial holes come from the ideas of Hawking in the 1970s, that these black holes would permeate space-time and they would be uniformly distributed with just a single mass, whatever the origin of that mass be. 
Now, the new paradigm that we proposed five years ago was that that's not necessarily true. It could be that black holes come in different masses. They're not just one mass, they come in different masses, they have a broad distribution. And moreover, since they can encounter each other, they can start to form clusters. And therefore, the distribution of masses and the spatial uh, distribution may be completely different. They might come in close. And this is crucial in order to evade all the uh, astrophysical bounds, and we can go into this at length in the discussion session, that uh, are evaded by this assumption of clustering. Now, fortunately, we are in a new era. Not only do we use photons, neutrinos, cosmic rays to explore our universe, we have for the first time in, in, in a century, the possibility to uh, look at uh, the universe in a different light, in this case, with gravitational waves. Gravitational waves which travel at the speed of light, they arrive at us at detectors like the LIGO and Virgo detectors and can inform about very violent phenomena like the uh, formation and, and, and merger of a binary, and the fusion of two black holes, minor black holes, or the formation and a fusion of two neutron stars in the famous kilonova that we observed. Now, the masses that have been observed through this new uh, window suggest that not all of these black holes could be astrophysical. In particular, there are masses in the mass gap, that means in a region, the astrophysical black hole mass gap, the lower mass gap, it's called, where uh, you don't expect stars to form black holes below five solar masses. And in the parent stability uh, upper uh, mass gap between about 60 and 120 or so uh, solar masses, where uh, these uh, tremendous giants of stars, which have already uh, burned their fuel until they uh, have an, an iron core, which no longer can sustain a thermonuclear reaction, they're not as efficient, would tend to collapse, to compress. The energy is enough to pair produce uh, electrons and positrons, and this creates an instability because these electrons and positrons reduce the radiation pressure, which indeed makes the gravitational collapse be even faster until the whole star obliterates, leaving nothing behind. Now, the fact that some of these events seen with gravitational waves happen to be precisely in this mass gap where you don't expect astrophysical uh, black holes to have arisen, it's a hint that we are dealing with a different kind of black hole, which could be primordial. Now, there I'm is some... Thank you. There is a, another way of looking into these uh, black holes, which is through microlensing. There are uh, observations of uh, black holes below a solar mass or around a solar mass through microlensing. Their error is still very big compared to those of gravitational waves, but in the future, definitely, we will have the, our ability to search below a solar mass. And a, due to, uh, I should insist here, a, there is a bound on any a black hole that you could form from stellar a collapse, which is that of the Chandrasekhar limit and has to do with the fundamental limit of the Pauli exclusion principle. You cannot collapse a, a gas of electrons or neutrons below a, a solar mass because you would have the electron degeneracy preventing producing another uh, pressure which prevents collapse. And therefore, we don't expect from astrophysics any black hole with less than one solar mass or 1.4 solar mass. Okay? Now, if such black holes would be seen, would be a clear indication that we are dealing with new phenomena. Okay? Now, we are uh, aware of these uh, black holes which have been observed by LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra. Here you have in, in a histogram the different lines correspond to different events. We have something like 100 events, uh, 100 not 50 events, which means 100 uh, compact objects, all of them distribute in a way which is consistent with some of the predictions that we made some years ago. We, of course, are searching now with objects which could be below the solar mass and therefore uh, give us this hint that they are, uh, there are uh, new objects out there which could contribute to the uh, nature of dark matter. Now, of course, is the future is bright, uh, we're not going to uh, um, stop at the frequencies that LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra can access, we're going to go beyond that, which means we're going to explore with a new generation of radiation wave detectors or antennas, in particular the uh, LISA, Less Interferometer Space Antenna, and the Anson Telescope. Now, the Anson Telescope is precisely designed so that they could be sensitive not only to below solar mass black holes, but also very distant black holes, all the way 
to say redshift 100 or 1000. And this opens a window, which is crucial because if we observe in the dark ages, binaries of black holes, which have merged, where you could not have formed stars in the first place, or very rarely, and therefore they would not have found each other in order to, to collapse and, and, and fuse together. This would be an extremely interesting hint that there is a new component, so dark matter made out of black holes. Now, black holes are a natural component. We have been hearing about the different cross sections, different couplings of dark matter to ordinary matter. Black holes are the ultimate cold dark matter because it has gravitational interactions, not even weak interactions. Okay, and therefore they're very natural candidates. Of course, they also resolve part of the issues that Jorge was addressing on the small scale structure, because if they form these clusters of 10 to the three solar masses, they are they could be responsible for some of the features that we observe in tidal streams. It could occupy, would form the halo of our galaxies. And it, we know we, we do simulations on the halos of galaxies with resolutions down to 10 to the six solar masses. So we would be talking about thousands of millions of these uh, clusters compressing the, the, the halo of our galaxy. So from that point of view, we cannot distinguish that small scale structure. Eventually through gravitational lensing, probably we'll be able to uh, reach those scales. So I think uh, the future is bright. We are, uh, uh, we will have access to this. I, if I would have had a few more minutes, I would go in beyond dark matter into dark energy, but I think I could, I'm, I'm going to stop here. I will leave that discussion if it arises for uh, for the section of, of the questions, so I'll I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, everyone, for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Juan.